Good evening and welcome to the Do Tell Story Swap of Sonoma County. My name is Katie Mangan and I'm so pleased that you're with us tonight and welcome to 2024. So tonight we've got at least five tellers and if you want to add your name, please do so. Um, we're going to follow our usual meeting format. We're going to tell stories um, that to be told and not read five to seven minutes, unless it's longer, and then we just need to know that. Um, there will be a break in the middle of the program, and um, you can get a cup of tea, glass of water, and then when we come back, there will be a prompt, a question, which we'll all answer and get to know each other a little better. And Meg will have some announcements. And, and then after the break, we will continue with more stories. So that is the evening. Now, have I forgotten anything important? Okay, great. Uh, so I'm really just to, um, to mute while people are talking, while people are telling stories. Right. If everybody can mute themselves when they're telling stories, except Vicky, when I need a prompt, <laughs> that would be awesome. Um, we're just really honored tonight because we have uh, our founders here. We have Elaine Stanley and Kenneth Foster. So thank you again for you both being here. And Kenneth is going to kick off the evening with a story. So now Kenneth, I'm going to spotlight you. Ah, oh, great. Oh. Um, I thought I'd start off before I tell my short story how stories come to me. Um, actually, I've been talking with Elaine about this a little bit, but I have probably over a hundred stories in my portfolio. And sometimes they just come to you. And a couple of weeks ago, uh, at the end of my day, I was just thinking about uh, the holidays and how everything was going. And I was thinking, you know, we need to be kinder to each other this year. And a thought came to me about a story I used to tell to high schoolers, well, middle school and high school. And a few key words of the story came to me, but I couldn't come up with the story. I just kept trying and trying. I talked to Elaine about it, and then I did some research, and I found the story. And, of course, it's not the way I used to tell it, so I'm going to tell it the way I remember telling it, okay? This, this is a deity story from Cuba. In the days when Obatala was the supreme ruler of the universe. He had a young helper that worked with him, whose name was Orula. Now, Batala thought highly of this young man. He watched him carefully. Uh, he observed all that he was doing. He found that his young helper made judgments that were fair. And all of his actions were praiseworthy. And so when it came time for Obatala to place a god over this world, naturally he thought of a ruler. But it bothered him a little bit because a ruler was young. And he was not sure that he had the wisdom and maturity of such an important position. So he thought about this for a little while, and then he called Arula to him. He wanted to test the young helper. Arula, I want you to prepare for me the best meal that can be devised. Arula 
humbly accepted the assignment. And he went to the market where all kinds of things were on display. There were meats of all kinds. There were fishes from the sea and from the rivers. There were fowls from the air, fresh vegetables, fruits, spices, herbs, and every other imaginable thing that you could think of. Orula looked over all of them. And he thought for a while, hmm, what should I prepare? And after a little while, he selected the ox tongue and all of the things that went in it and the spices. And he took the ox tongue home and he dressed it with the delicate spices and rubbed them into the flesh. And then he cooked it slowly in its own juices. And when it was finally ready, he, ser he served it to the supreme ruler of the universe. And Obatala took the first taste. It was delicious. And every bite after that, he savored it. He smacked his lips. This is wonderful. Orula, why is the ox tongue the best? Oh, honored Obata, the tongue is very important. With it, virtue and good manners can be taught. With it, great things can be discussed. Ideas can be put into action. And with the tongue, Deserving men and women can be praised. Obatala was pleased with Orula's answer. But he still wasn't sure. And so a few days later, he called Orula back. Orula! I want you to prepare for me the worst meal ever made. Orula humbly accepted the assignment. And he went back to the market. All of the different meats, the fishes of the seas and the rivers, all of the fowls of the air, the fresh vegetables and fruits and herbs and spices and all else. And Orula looked over everything, considering them carefully. And he selected the ox tongue again and all that went with it. He took the tongue home and he dressed it with the delicate spices he cooked it carefully, and when it was ready, he served it to the supreme ruler of the universe. And Abata was surprised. Orula, how can the best be the worst? Oh, honored Orula, oh, Abata, I have already explained to you why the tongue is important and the best, but it can also be the worst. With it, people's reputation can be slandered, their lives destroyed, whole nations can be ruined and sold. So, sir, I serve you the same meal. Obatala was impressed 
And he marveled at the wisdom and maturity of this young man. And so without a moment's hesitation, he proclaimed Orula, God and ruler of this world. Sorry, Kenneth, thank you. That was just such a wonderful story. So beautifully told and so timely. So timely. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Perfect. Ha. Huh. Well, our next teller is Vicky Ness. You did it. I am so impressed, Katie. <laughs> Thank you, Vicki. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was an invisible woman. Now, it, it's not that people couldn't see her. It's simply that they never noticed her. She was a nobody. She was invisible. Her name was Midge. And, and she was an amateur inventor but she was also a very compassionate person. And while nobody looked at her, uh, she, she noticed everybody else. She noticed, in fact, that people in her town seemed to be needing something. They seemed to be longing for something and looking for something that they couldn't find. And so she thought about it. And then she came up with an invention. Well, it so happened at that same time, the city council members of the town decided that it was time to put their town on the map. Not a pin dot, but a star, a destination, not a drive through, a place to see and be seen. And so they decided on a week long lean into the future celebration for the whole town. And it would be kicked off by a maker's fair on the first weekend. And so everybody who had anything new, uh, different, whatever, could, could present it in the town square that weekend. And so the bakers came and the painters came and the poets came and the singers came. And yes, the inventors came. And there was Midge with her marvelous machine. And she turned it on. And it weaseled and it woozled and it woof, 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 and it piffed and piffed and piffed and piffed. And out of a, a red tin pipe came big puffs of steam and, 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 and a flywheel turned a doll's hand that turned the crank on a music box that played Laura's theme from Dr. Zhivago. Dee, 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 dee. Oh, it was beautiful. Oh, and people gathered and they stared and they watched. But on the other side, you see, there was a huge, oh, cast iron weight that went up by ratchets, 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 ratchets. And at odd moments, the ratchets would pull in and the weight would fall with a huge whoomp on a deep purple satin whoopee cushion that would quack very rudely, very noisily and very rudely. And the children loved it, loved it, loved it. And then it would ratchet, ratchet, ratchet. Boom. Oh, the kids would laugh and laugh and laugh. And it came to where strangers would talk to strangers. Look, look, did you see this watch? All over the machine, you see, things would be illuminated for just a second. Woof, ooh. Oh, it was a little green army man in a pink tutu. Woof, woof. Oh, look, it's a blue jay feather, but the end of it has been dipped in gold. Woof, woof. Oh, rhinestones and a hand-colored old photo. Woof, all over the machine. Woof, 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 woof. There was even a clock face with eyes and eyebrows and nose and mouth that moved independently, creating hundreds of facial expressions, all according to the rickety tick, rickety tick, rickety tick 
of the brass workings in the back. People loved it. Oh, they stared. They called their grandparents over to see it. They brought their kids. They brought their out of town guests. They held up their little doggies. Look, Snooky, woo, look, watch, it's gonna do it again. Watch, watch, watch. They loved the machine. It made them so happy. In fact, it made everybody so happy that at the end of the weekend, the city council members were loath to take it down. <clears throat> because you see, they didn't, they didn't want the townspeople to be angry with them and the people could not get enough of it. Why they were there day and night, rain or shine, staring at that ridiculous machine and, and talking and laughing. And so they left it there. They called it an art installation and they moved on. Well, the end of the week was capped off by a conference for the movers and the shakers in the world those highly visible people who could see into the future. Oh, and they'd tell us what we need and how to get that. So that morning, Saturday morning was clear and calm and, and all of the movers and shakers were in the city conference room, a big picture window looking down onto the town square with that stupid machine and the people gathering around it. And 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 it was before the conference, so all the movers and shakers had their little cup of tepid coffee and and their flaccid, greasy Danish, and, and they weren't chomping and looking and sipping and looking and and finally, one of them from the merchant group pointed down at the square and said, "I what 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 is wrong with people? That machine does nothing." It does nothing, why, wait, we, we, we have what they want. And he opened up his jacket pocket and pulled out a rather large, fat fork. He said, watch. And he turned it on and he proceeded to dip and dip and dip as though somebody might if they were eating. Well, when he dipped the 12th time out of a little microphone came the rudest comments. Hey, Lardo, you gonna keep eating? Dip, yo, buoy bottom, why don't you lick the plate? So embarrassing, the people will drop the fork and they'll stop eating. <clears throat> no more exercises, no more dreary regimens or dangerous diet pills. The insult a fork will keep you from overeating. That's what the people need, the insult a fork. Hmm. Well, the, the city council members looked at the merchants and were a little disturbed. Well, actually, 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 we've decided what they really need is a, a sense of status. You know, we're all human and we all like to feel that we're better than maybe we really are. And so we thought, right, with that stupid machine is, we would put, oh, a statue to our town founder, Horace Snigglewurm. And, and and we'd form a foundation, the Snigglewurm Foundation. And, and for an annual fee that goes right into the city coffers, you could be a member, you see. And 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 oh, and, and you'd get a, a bumper sticker for that year that, that would say, ready? I'm a snigglewormer. Are you? Now the fact that Horace Snigglewurm was a cold, calculating, and cruel slumlord and money launderer. Who, who hated his children and detested the town that he founded, it wasn't the point. It, 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 it came down to, I'm a sniggle warmer. Are you? Oh, you could practically see the fairy dust all around the council members. But the tech people thought that was pathetic. That's so 20th century. No, no, what people really need they need a virtual town square. You see, it would be bright green with little daisies here and there and, 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 and the occasional rabbit hole that people would fall into and disappear. But anyway, and it would be lined with unlimited shopping opportunities, you see. And, and everybody could meet their friends and their neighbors. And oh, everybody would have a marvelous time. But here's the kicker. Once a day, we would let loose a virtual bulldog that would run out and grab 
somebody out of the crowd and shake the life out of them and gobble up their bloody shards of flesh before going back into his doghouse. You see, this, this makes people feel alive. Oh yes, it gives them a sense of adventure and they will feel alive. Mm. Well, you see, none of them could actually agree on what people really needed, but they all did agree that they didn't need that stupid machine. What have people seen it? That's a stupid machine, it doesn't do anything. Well, if they had looked a little closer, they might've noticed what that machine did was that it made the frowny faces hmm, smile. And, and it made those who were cold and cynical remember their childhood. And the children, oh, it let their imaginations loose like flocks of birds. And, and strangers nudged strangers and said, look, no, seriously, watch this. There it goes, did you see it? In fact, Everybody who looked on the machine fell into a kind of a spell that suddenly brought out all the joy and the innocence and the wonder and a generous spirit that couldn't wait to share that joy with their neighbors, whoever they were. And, and you know what? If they had asked Midge, which they wouldn't have, she would have said, well, yes, what the people needed was what they had all along. They just needed to see it. Vicky, you've done it again. It was just awesome. Thank you. Um, your voices and the sounds, I just love and the complicated machine, but I think the insult of fork. <laughs> was just... Everybody needs an insult of fork. I think so. And then the weird and wonderful a uh, bulldog. I mean, it's just terrifying. Um, I'm, I'm glad you don't rule, rule the world. I mean, it would be yeah. a- It's a probably just as well. <laughs> just as well. Thank you again. That's awesome. Okay. So from Vicky's world, we're now going to visit Beth in Hawaii. So let me um, find Beth. Here you are. Aloha. I'm fortunate that I have a Zoom and I have a connection so I can join this wonderful group. I am uh, I am speechless after the last two stories. So I'm going to bring us to a little calmer and shorter version. My story uh, comes from the um, First Peoples, the Susquamish in the Washington area. And it's from a book by Naomi Maltek called Apples from Heaven, stories about storytellers or of for storytellers. It's it, probably a few decades, but I'm sharing her retold story of the gossiping clams. Now in the very early days, in the very beginning, before the human beings had even arrived, animals could talk to each other. And the most talkative of all of course, was the clam because his mouth spread from one side to the other of the whole body. Now, clam loved talking and clam loved sharing stories. Some of the stories were true and some of the stories were not. In fact, Eagle was down on the shore and clam spoke up and said, oh, Eagle, Eagle, do you know Raven thinks that much, much better hunter than you are, Eagle said, with ruffled feathers, with some annoyance. Well, that may be true if picking at carrion is considered hunting. Huh. And Eagle flew off. Another time, Otter was coming down to the beach to, you know, have a good time in the water. Clam spoke. Oh, water? I, I don't think you look foolish splashing in the water. Foolish? Well, who, who says I look foolish? Said water. Well, 
clamps and oh it's not for me to say oh no no but uh, but you know beaver thinks everyone worked just as hard as she does and this went on and the animals began to quarrel with each other and finally raven had had enough and called all the animals he could together the mink the otter bear eagle all the animals agreed that something had to be done about all the unkind words. They couldn't get along. They could not decide what to do and how to do the punishment. So, of course, they called on Beaver. Now, Beaver, you are a very, very hardworking one, and we know that you will work hard to help come up with some form of punishment so we can get on with our lives. Beaver thought and, and thought, and, and finally she came up with an idea. She went down to the shoreline and she began gathering all the clams, big armfuls of clams, every last clam. They were rather startled, upset. What are you doing? And she took them down to the tide line and waited until the tide was way out and then quickly dug a hole for each one of those clams, stuck them right in the sand. And oh, they were outraged indeed. Well, next time Bear came down, one of the clams tried so hard to tattle on Beaver. But all that came out, of course, opened the mouth and in went the water in the sand and sp spitting out the water in the sand. In fact, if you go down to the shore today on low tide, you might see a little bit of that water, sand, just coming up when the tide is down low. That's just the clams trying so hard to speak up. And yet all they can do is spit out and no more gossip can come from them anymore. The story of the gossiping clams. <laughs> I think it lends itself to being kind. <laughs> oh, thank you, Beth. I'm sorry I took the, the camera away from you too fast. That was wonderful. Oh, what, what a clever beaver <laughs> to figure that out. Thank you so much. I love your stories. Beautifully told. And now on our list, we have Sharon. So I'm going to look for Sharon. Oh, there you are. This is a completely different kind of story. This is a personal story about um, 1952, the year that I remember best when I was nine years old. And in 1952, I saw my task as trying to understand the adults around me because it seemed to me that their behaviors were very strange. And I was hoping to become one of them at some point. And so I watched them with great care. And the entertainment and information center of our household was the radio. And it was in the living room in a big console. And in those days, things were different. You couldn't just put in your earbuds and go anywhere while you listen to your podcast. If you wanted to hear the radio, you needed to be in the room with the radio. And my mother timed her housework by whether she could get done in time to hear her favorite soap opera. And the tragedies that those soap opera women endure week after week of terrible, terrible traumas and distress. Sometimes while my mother was darning and mending, she would drop a tear or two on her work, feeling sorry for those poor women, like Stella Dallas, whose daughter had married into a social stratus far above hers. And she knew that her ignorant manners and crude ways of behaving would embarrass her daughter. And so she slid quietly out of her life to watch her at a distance for week after week after week after week. 
And my father listened to scary things, really scary things, like inner sanctum, which began with the sound of a creaking door and then footsteps going down a hollow hallway. And I never found out where they were going or what the inner sanctum was because I was too scared to stay in the room for very long with that one. I was out of there. And then there was, what else did he listen to? Oh, the shadow. Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? The shadow knows. And the scariest of all was I was a communist for the FBI. And it told the story of a brave and loyal American man who went into the cells. I guess communists live in cells like these or prisoners. And he went into a communist cell and pretended to be one so that he could uncover their nefarious deeds and their plans to destroy our country. And of course, there were kids being, you know, Captain Kangaroo and Howdy Doody. I wasn't interested in any of that. But there was one point during the week when my mother and my father and me were all glued to the radio together, watching and listening to the same thing. I say watching, but we used to stare at that console as our imaginations went off on whatever we were listening to. And in this case, it was your hit parade. And somebody, we never found out who it was or how they possibly did it, but somebody went over the whole country and gathered the statistics on which music sold the most sheet music, was played most on jukeboxes, went out most over the radio, and they found the 15 most popular songs for that week. And we listened breathlessly as they played the top 15, and then the top three, and finally the top one. And of course, we all had our favorites. My dad loved Eddie Fisher. He sang, oh, my papa. To me, he was so wonderful. And my mom was a big fan of the Mills Brothers. And the songs that I remember that particular year, the best one was Glow, Little Glow Worm, Glimmer, Glimmer. She just loved those notes, brother. And we all love Frankie Lane singing Mule Train. And the theme song from High Noon, Do Not Forsake Me, Oh My Darling. It was so dramatic and so much fun. And we were right there together. And then, when the theme song came up, goodbye for a while. That's all the songs for a while. We split up and went off into our separate lives. Well, when rock and roll came along, your hit parade lasted for a couple of years of television, a couple of seasons of television, and then it died both as a concept and, and as a radio program. And the reason was that none of us liked the same music anymore. As a little girl, I went to dances with my parents. I remember standing on my grandfather's feet to dance with him. We all danced together. But by the time rock and roll came, it was a different matter. I liked to do the bop and the chicken and Listen to Chuck Berry and Fats Domino. No grown-ups like to do those moves. No grown-ups like to hear that, that I know about. They were just in a different world. The church dances got divided. The grown-ups were in one boring room where they were waltzing and doing the foxtrot, and we were in another room by ourselves. And I didn't know what they were doing, but at that point in my life, I didn't care, as I had before, what they were doing. I liked what we were doing. My mother said that something was lost 
when rock and roll came along and families came apart and didn't share that same love of the same song. I didn't see her point. But now that I'm at the other end of the age, and I see and hear the music that my children and grandchildren are listening to, now I'm the one saying, you call that music? And who are these people? And so maybe she was right that something was lost and that that same song, so long for a while, that's all the songs for a while, really did bring something to an end. Thank you, Sharon. That's wonderful. That was such a great trip down memory lane. <laughs> it really was. And also, I, I agree with your mom. You know, something was lost when rock and roll came along. Yeah. That was so good. Thank you very much. Beautifully told as well. Thank you. So we have Laura next. Um, remove myself and find Laura. There you go. Hello. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell a story called The Frog Who Wouldn't Budge. And I created it for a novel that I wrote that is a uh, situated in Illinois where I grew up and there's a storyteller in the novel and she starts telling the story to someone she's taken in and then they get interrupted and she doesn't have a chance to finish it so at a certain point in the story the young person wants to encourage someone and so she finishes it herself and I, I haven't really, I haven't practiced a story, you know, and I was thinking, oh, I can't tell it. And then I finally said to myself, well, you created it. You must be able to tell it. I mean, if you can't, there's going to be, there's something really wrong with your brain, you know? <laughs> so there we go. Um, so back when Illinois was uh, inhabited by members of Illini tribes and a smattering of French trappers, a trapper decided to build a cabin at a pond that was very isolated and quiet. Or, well, at least he thought it was quiet, but it turned out that a beautiful golden frog lived there. And that frog had lived there for a very long time, way before the trapper found the pond. And this was a problem because that frog made a lot of noise all day. He went chuck, 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 ribbit, ribbit, croak, croak, croak. And the trapper wanted quiet. He didn't like this at all. So he went to the edge of the pond and he said, quiet down frog or I'm gonna throw you out of here. But the frog wasn't scared. The frog wasn't cowed. The frog didn't budge. And he just went about croaking and chuck, 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 croak, chuck, 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 croak, chuck, 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 chuck. And he wouldn't move at all. Well, the trapper went into his new cabin and he got out his shotgun. And he stomped on back to the pond and he held out that shotgun. And he said, you quiet down frog or I'm going to blow you to high heaven. But the frog wasn't scared. The frog didn't budge. The frog just stayed there and croaked, 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 and chuck, chuck, chucked, and croaked, and chucked, and croaked, and chucked, and oh, that copper, he shot it off, and buckshot flew everywhere. And a lot of it landed on the frog, but the frog became spotted 
He was gold now with uh, greenish brown spots, but he didn't move. He wasn't scared. He, he didn't get cowed at all. Didn't budge one little bit. And he went on. Oh, chuck, 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 chuck. The trapper had to think about what to do next because that noise was really bothering him. He wanted a quiet pond. Then he got an idea. I'm going to sneak up on him and grab him and choke him. And that'll be that. So very slowly, very, very slow. Took him a long time, you know, just inch by inch by inch. He approached that frog. Finally, he got really close. And he grabbed the frog. <laughs> I got you now. But the frog was slippery. And he tickled the hands of the trapper. And he wiggled and jiggled. And he jumped right out. And he went chuck, chuck, chuck. Grow, 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 chuck, chuck, grow, grow, chuck, chuck, chuck. And right back to the pond. And that's where he stayed. He wouldn't budge. And the trapper was really, really, really mad. But he wasn't about to give up. Because, I mean, you know, he was a great big trapper. This was a little little frog that wasn't even beautiful anymore. It was like spotted, you know, really funny looking. And he thought, aha, I have a net. I'll get him in a net and he won't slip out of the net. So he sneaked up again. And he had a net in his hand this time. Very slowly, hardly made a sound. And the frog was... Crow, 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 chuck, 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 crow, 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 chuck, 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 happily in his pot. And he got real close again. He got him in the net. <laughs> yes, now I have you and you can't slip out of my hand. Hmm. He didn't know quite what to do with him. Ah, I'm going to bury you. So he put the net down and put a rock right on the edge so the frog could not wiggle out. And he dug a hole, and he dug that hole really, 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 really deep. And he threw that frog in, and then he covered it all back up. And it was quiet. He was so happy. He made himself uh, a nice stew outside of his cabin in an open air fire there. And, uh, had some biscuits and he had a blanket and a you know bedroll kind of thing that he was resting on. He hadn't slept in such a long time. He was happy there by the fire and it was still going nice and strong. So he was so comfortable. He just fell asleep and it was really nice. But then he heard. He said, where is it? Oh. It was coming right from where he had buried that frog. Oh, he had never been more furious in his whole life before that. And he dug that frog up with his hands and he got him out and the fire was still roaring. He threw that frog right into the fire. There was a sizzle and a pop. And then all these sparks flew right at the trapper, landing all over the place. And whenever a frog, a, a spark landed, it turned into a little baby frog. So he was covered with hundreds and hundreds of baby frogs. And they were not golden because the frog had changed to tan in the dirt underground. So they were tan with the little greenish brown spots and they were all over him. And he was trying to shake him off and he ran off and they were hopping after him. Croak, 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 chuck, chuck, chuck in great harmony. And he was screaming and it was terrible, but off you went. Ugh. And those were the ancestors of the leopard frogs that live in Illinois to these days. And they probably live other places too. And as for the trapper, 
nobody ever heard from him again. Not in Illinois, anyway. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh. oh, Laura, that was absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I, I just loved, you know, I mean, it was so visual and, and how you did it all. But when the trapper lay down and went to sleep, you know, you could just you could just hear the silence. I mean, it was just brilliant. And then, of course, that wretched frog started again. <laughs> <laughs> it was perfect. Thank you so much. This is great. So I'm thinking, why don't we take a short break now? Um, I'm going to pause, or maybe Vicky, would you pause the recording? Last three. Welcome back. And now we're going to introduce ourselves and we're going to answer a question. And the question is, is there something on your bucket list that you want to do this year? And I'm going to start, and I, my name is Katie Mangan, and I live in Santa Rosa. And what's on my bucket list this year, which I really want to do, is to go back to the British Isles. Um, I'm doing a, a, a wonderful class, four-month class on Zoom about Celtic wisdom. And so I would like mm. to visit Scotland, England, Ireland, or Wales, or all of them. That's what's on my bucket list. <laughs> So now I'm going wow. to ask Kenneth, what's on your bucket list? Well, I'm Kenneth Foster. I'm uh, in Ephraim, Utah. And I was just thinking about that. What I am so close to all the national parks in southern Utah. Um, Arches, uh, Zion, Bryce, uh, you know, Capitol Reef. And I haven't visited any of them and i would like to do that this year i would like to at least go to two or three of them if i could <laughs> so, yeah beth what's on your bucket list this is a hard one um for me personally i want to get out and do more in the in nature too with i, I visited much but there's so many family issues that I just want to make sure I can connect with my sister and my brother and people in my family who are very ill um, but, and have that connection before it gets too late. Just, <laughs> and to learn more stories. <laughs> Meg. Um, well, I was just talking to my daughter this afternoon about my bucket list goal and that is to get my whole family out to do some camping in the Sierras. My grandsons have not gone camping with us. And it's just one of those things that I remember, you know, growing up, we always went camping. And if we could gather family together to come with us, it was just even more special. So um, this is the year we're going to we're going to put it together and we're going to go camping this summer and uh, enjoy those little boys and how they how they respond to being in the wilderness. It's just very exciting. <laughs> Tell us about your bucket list item. Oh, Vicki. Oh, <laughs> sorry. I'm Vicki Ness and I live in Sebastopol, California. And, um, you know, last year. I wanted to start drawing again. I used to do artwork and I loved it. So in this room, there was a dresser, uh, an old dresser, and I took it out and I put a table in so I could do that. Well, that was eight months ago and not a darn thing has happened. And so this year I am going to pick up my pencils and my pastels and I'm going to do this. That's on my bucket list. Awesome. Laura, what's on your bucket list? Hmm. I I want to go to the Mendocino County Writers Conference. That is supposed to be a fabulous gathering. Costs hundreds of dollars, just mm. a couple of days. Mm. But I'm gonna let myself go. Right. That would be exciting. Yeah. Darren. 
You say Sharon? Yes, sorry, Sharon. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Duh, I'm, I'm in another <laughs> world. I'm thinking about that writer's conference. Um, I'm Sharon, and I'm in Bremerton, Washington, in the rain, as usual. <laughs> just, I'm just astonished to live someplace where people have to drive with their lights on all day long, every day. You know, it's just, it's really different than, than where you folks are. And my bucket list this year is to find a way to connect the interesting stories I know about our ancestors to the grandchildren who haven't heard them and don't know them, uh, to try to spark their interest in their family history. Nice, thank you. Gay, Barna. Hi. Um, I'm Gay Barner, and I'm in Santa Rosa, and I'm going to join the people that want to, um, the bucket list that have um, wanting to get together with relatives and family that I haven't seen for a really long time. Mine are on the East Coast, and like the um, people have been saying, I don't want to let it get too late to go do this. Genevieve. I think you need to unmute yourself. Yes. Hi. I began, let's see, a year ago in October, I went to a little, one of those little presentations that people do at the Finley Center. And then uh, in the subsequent months, I thought about what they proposed and I decided I was going to uh, get, uh, register for some, training in voiceover mm. and um, I finished my uh, courses for what's called you know commercial voiceover commercial and narration and I just got noticed that my demo reel is done so uh, and then I'm going to go on possibly to do animation or possibly audiobooks but I think I'm going to start with animation because when I saw Coco, I wanted to be one of those voices. And there's going to be a Toy Story 5 coming up. I'm probably too late for the casting call. It's a very competitive field. And um, also, artificial intelligence has really trashed our aspirations. Uh, but... And I have, you have to protect your, you know, your people will take your voice and sell it. But I think that that's on my bucket list. It turns out that it's something I'd wanted to do for decades. Several times I tried it, um, you know, dabbled with the possibility of signing up. So there you are. Just two days ago. I haven't even listened to my demo reel. I'm so excited. Someone so want to come and listen to it with me? <laughs> would this be in English and Spanish? That you would be well that's that's the potential that i have because i could do I, I i'm able to do english spanish and french okay and i can do pretty much when i when even though i never i didn't have the discipline to learn other languages but when i pretend that i'm speaking them people think i speak them fluently yeah. <laughs> you know i mean i once i think i once said you know i don't know Anyway, I, I was once dabbling in make-believe German and someone started talking away. I said, no, 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 you know, <laughs> it's good, you know, <laughs> no more, thank you. But so I, I'm kind of excited and we'll see where it goes. Good, congratulations. But if not, I still want to do more storytelling. That's always here, yeah. So I yeah. think... We're just, I think everybody, the other few people have left. So, um, Nancy? Nancy, there was Nancy, Marty, and. Um, Nancy is on. Nancy oh, is on. Hey, oh, Nancy. there you are. Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm Zooming from Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. Um, so, I, I was going through a few things in my mind. I'm not sure. I'm not sure about these, but well, I just thought I would try maybe for the bucket list, like try snowboarding or more cross-country skiing this winter. Great. 
Thank you. Thank you for sorry, coming. Sorry, I out. didn't yeah. see you. I'm so I'm so sorry. So Marty, are you here? And I think you got everybody. Joy has left. I think. Okay. And, and Elaine has left. All right, so Meg, would you like to do the um, announcements, please? Thank oh, you. sure, sure, I'll do announcements. <laughs> um, and to remind you all that you can find lots of information on the SAC website, Storytelling Association of California. They they uh, have a great website and you can, you can check them out. But let's see, so there are two save the dates, guys. The first is March 9th, and that's going to be the SAC Annual Membership Meeting and Regional GEM Award Performance. And this is a, it's a really important uh, gathering because SAC is getting together to, you know, find out what we think, what do we need? How can they help us? They're really a great organization. And we have a couple of our people um, who are involved in that and, and they just do great work. Um, Jean Ellison will be the 2024 Regional GEM uh, honoree this uh, year, and they have performances at this. Um, I'm not sure I didn't write down where it's going to be, and but you again, you can put it on your calendar, get all the details on the SAC website, and we probably will be following up in the next couple of months with that myself. So that's the first thing. The second thing to put on your calendar as save the date is the Bay Area Storytelling Festival, which is gonna be up here in Santa Rosa. And uh, Brandon has really been involved in this, of course. I believe they're going to have it at uh, Sonoma Academy. Um, it is May 3rd and 4th. And anyone who's ever been to the Bay Area Storytelling Festival knows that there are amazing guest tellers amazing stories that you will remember forever and um, they're just so so really great so I'm sure more uh, information will be coming around about that who's going to be telling and all of that but you know just if you're planning out that bucket list put that one on there because um, it's a great event for us um, more quickly um, we have genre storytelling and that's this month is going to be tall tales and it's January 17th. Um, and, and, and I think they probably have their roster by now. But um, in February, it will be the 21st. And it will be romantic stories. Hmm, interesting. And so if you are interested in uh, telling on the genre, contact Katie. Because they're always looking for people. There is a deadline about two weeks before the, the genre event so um you know but if you're interested sign up because i'm pretty sure that you can get a good opportunity to tell and then in march they'll have myths fables fairy tales and fantasies um the way that genre works if you are a sac member it's free and believe me it's worth it um, if not, it's a $5 fee. So if, if you're really interested in these, you know, after a while, you might as well just become a member and becoming a member of SAC is a, is a really, uh, great way to keep in touch and hear all about things that are happening in the Bay, well, in California, uh, for storytelling. So that two dates to put on your calendar and think about, uh, getting, into the genre uh, events this every month and this month on the 17th. And that's it, I've got, that's all I got. <laughs> and if you're not a member, the genre is what, five, ten dollars Not very much. It's $5, it's $5, yeah, to get, and you pay that and then they give you the link, so. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Meg. Mm -hmm. So now we are, ready to roll again. So I'm going to ask Genevieve to, to tell us about a story. Okay. Um, wait, wait, I'm, I'm hoping to create a story, something along the lines of the juggler, but it's not written yet. But um, I'm only going to share something which is connected to the story I last told 
here and also I think I told a, a draft here and then I redid it more historically for genre storytelling uh, for sacred and inspirational stories. And so what happened is that I got totally immersed in the whole idea of Our Lady of Guadalupe, the myths, the mystery, and the magic and the mumbo jumbo about it. And it's been fascinating because there's a lot of little aspects that you can begin to think about. On the one hand, this is an event that may or may not have happened, but certainly has created a certain connection and a, a source of hope for people of all classes from all walks of life, not only in Mexico, but around the world. Some people criticize it as having been used as a tool to subjugate the indigenous peoples of Mexico and to have them all convert to Catholicism. But as I was doing my research, I thought, oh, this one particular bishop who is the star of the show from that perspective, in a way, if they created this image story and were able to get Juan Diego to play the part of the uh, young man who sees the image of Our Lady Guadalupe, it was fairly ingeniously done, but it occurred to me that it was also possibly not a way to dominate entirely the indigenous people, but to spare them because they were going to be subjugated one way or another. The firepower was not in their favor. And they were not likely to want to adopt the Catholic religion, which was one of the prerequisites for survival in that subjugated space. So by creating another image of the mother goddess Tonantzin to appear precisely in the place where the Aztecs used to worship Tonantzin, they were able to get buy-in to the very thing that was going to keep them alive. So that's my theory, and I've never heard it anywhere else. But as I was reading, I thought, what would have motivated the bishop to do this? Yeah, you're gonna get, his job was to get a lot of people baptized. But in doing so, they simply said, you know, one goddess, another goddess, same goddess to me. <laughs> a pretty goddess, she's of my color, hey. So was it manipulative or was it ingenious? The years and years and years later, centuries, decades now, we see that it has created something else. It has created a place for the very people who, especially the very many people who have very little to hope for, find a place of solace. So that was my research, but I decided then to write something and if you give me just a second, I will find it, okay? Now, one of the things that Our Lady of Guadalupe is said to have assured Juan Diego one of the times that he saw her. And you'll see this inscription often in the images. It says, am I not here who am your mother? So this is something I wrote. And how many of you have traveled in Mexico? Okay. So not only in Mexico, but I mean, you go to Healdsburg and you know, see her image all over you, everywhere. But uh, some of you will particularly resonate to some of the images here, okay? Am I not here? She is seen in medals resting on the next, oh, I'm sorry, one more thing. Um, this is reflective of the fact that I'm a spiritual care provider at Kaiser and I specialize in visiting Latino people, people whose primary language is Spanish. 
And so one of the things we often give them is a little image of Our Lady of Guadalupe because that's what they ask for. And also that I am an interpreter in the courts and my language is Spanish, English. And many, many times I see images of Our Lady of Guadalupe in the people that, with accompanying the people that I serve. Okay, here we go. She is seen in medals resting on the necks of mothers achingly aggrieved over the circumstances of their children. She is seen in tattoos of defendants who stand powerless before a magistrate. She is seen on a laminated card gripped by a patient racked with cancer. She permeates the small statues held tightly by victims of sexual assault. She is nestled inside the satin covers of caskets of young men brought down in drive-by shootings and graces the velvet capes of matadores. She ripples triumphantly on banners above marble altars in chandeliered cathedrals and humble chapels lit with candles. She is framed in gold and silver filigree in palace halls and casts her serene glance from paper prints thumbtacked onto dingy hovel walls. She is the Queen of Mexico, Empress of the Americas, and mother of us all, children of the earth. Her image dances off the mirrors of truckers and bus drivers, taxis and limousines. She rides painted on the crates of farmers delivering produce and the truck panels of laborers going to the field. She is seen on the sides of botellones holding water, jars filled with beans and rice, and boxes overflowing with tomatoes and peppers. She plays on the cotton frocks of toddlers and follows soccer games from the sweaty brims of baseball caps. She rumbles by full-sized from the back of 18 wheelers lit with Christmas lights year round and demurely guards souls from tiny tin and glass altars perched on splintered window sills. She's knit into socks and imprinted onto face masks, emblazoned on rhinestone studded t-shirts and down the sides of cotton pants. She was carried by rebels in the Mexican revolution even though they were railing against the institutionalized church. She is carried still in fervent processions throughout the world. She is the queen of Mexico, empress of the Americas and mother of us all, children of the earth. She is seen in our hearts. So oh, beautiful, Genevieve, thank you so much. I, I had the pleasure and honor to, to hear Genevieve tell, her, tell that story at the genre series um, in December. It was very moving. Thank you so much, thank beautiful. You. And now I think we're going to go to see Kenneth again. He's gonna tell us about his, his frog story, which was, for those of you who remember, Cal, do you remember, who remembers Cal? <laughs> it was one of his favorite stories. I miss Cal. I don't, I don't know, have, how many of you have heard this? I don't know if I wanted, uh, uh, actually uh, Meg just alluded to it. I oh. call it an Admiral story, but uh, it starts that. Uh, this is um, a true story. Uh, Actually, 1953. Um, so I was a little younger than uh, the story we heard earlier. And I, I'm sorry about the name. <laughs> so um, my best friend lived next door. His name was Martin. And Martin and I played every day outside. Uh, we loved it. We grew up in Albuquerque, outside of Albuquerque. And this day we decided we were gonna go out and throw dirt clods at each other. Um, that was our typical thing that we'd like to do, but it had rained the night before and the dirt clods were actually mud, weren't 
sticking together. And so we decided we were going to go down to the creek and get wet. You know, that's what eight-year-olds did at the time. And um, we went down to the creek. And to our surprise, there were thousands and thousands of polywogs. They were just all over. And... We forgot about getting wet. We just sat down on the bank and watched them swim this way and that way. And the water was just black with them. And there were just thousands of polywogs in the creek. And pretty soon, you know, we started picking them up. And I'd say, look, Martin, I got two. And then he'd pick them up. I've got three. And then I, I got five. And before you know it, a contest had started and Martin went up and down the creek and he got a 10 can and he had like 10 in the can. And I said, you know, I didn't want to be outdone. So I started walking up and down the creek and I found a, a blue and brown uh, coffee can. Some of you will remember that brand. And I picked it up and I had 15 polys in that can. And next thing I know, Martin takes off running for his house. Now, we live next door to each other. So I knew where he was going. His dad always kept a bucket on the carport that he used to wash his car. And I knew Martin was heading for that bucket. So I took off running for my house. And when I got to the house, I could not find the bucket anywhere. I don't know where dad put it, but I couldn't find it. But there on the back porch was my red flyer wagon. And I grabbed the handle of that red flyer wagon and I started running. And of course, we lived on a gravel road and that wagon was bouncing and banging and hitting me in the back of the leg as I was running, but I didn't care. I needed to get to the creek first. Well, Martin had beat me, and when I got there, he was pulling his bucket out of the water. There must have been 50, maybe even 150 hollies in that bucket. But we couldn't really see them all because there was mud, and that green slimy stuff that floats on the water in the creek, it, it was hard to see. But then we had an idea. Let's see how many polys we could get in the wagon. And so Martin dumped the bucket back into the creek and we had to wait a little while until all that mud and everything settled out and we could see what we were doing. And we started scooping just clean water and putting in the wagon. And we filled it about half full. And then we used our cans and started picking up polys and putting in the wagon. And we just kept putting more and more and more. And we found out we didn't have enough water because they were flopping around and jumping out of the wagon and flopping around on the floor or on the ground. So we filled the wagon right up to the edge with water. And then we just kept putting more and more polys in that wagon. You could not see the bottom of the wagon because it was just black and brown with polywogs swimming from one end to the other end, back and forth. Oh man, what a sight. We just loved it. Then we had even another idea. <laughs> Let's take this wagon back to the house and call all our friends and have them come and see how many polys we had caught. Well, you know, it's a slow trip going from the creek back to my house on a gravel road. The water was sloshing back and forth and we lost a few polys along the way. And then my dog Blackie came along now, the red wagon was his wagon. He liked to sit in that wagon when we carried it. And now something else was in the wagon, and he stuck his nose in there and didn't like it. And he was barking and 
bouncing against the wagon, trying to knock it over. And so we had to throw sticks and stuff until Blackie got distracted enough that he left us alone and we made it back to the back porch. And we lifted the wagon carefully onto the back porch. And then we just had a great time. We called everybody. And it was easy in those days because everybody was on a party line. So you only called one number and everybody knew about it. And they all came running over to see it. And we had a great time picking them up and playing with them. Now, my sister, who was seven, she had long hair. It was blonde all the way down to her backside. And we decided that we would see if we could put the polys in her hair. And we started chasing her and she was screaming and I don't think she was really afraid of us. She just didn't want the polywogs in her hair. And, oh, we had a great time chasing her. And she was screaming. And that made us even happier. And pretty soon, it became supper time. And, of course, in those days, the moms didn't use telephones to call their kids. They just got out on the back porch and said, Kenny Jane! Billy Bob, Martin. Of course, you never went on the first call. You waited until mom called three times. And then you'd mosey on home and, and get there. We forgot all about the poly walks in the wagon. The next day was a beautiful day. We went out. We played cowboys and Indians and threw dirt clots at each other around the tumbleweeds. We had a great time. The day after that was another beautiful day. We went out and climbed in the cottonwood trees. We had a fort, no girls allowed. It was a sign on the side of the tree. And that was fun. And we just sort of forgot about the polywalks. Well, the third day happened to be a Saturday. And I usually slept in on a Saturday. And the next thing I know, mom is screaming all three of my names. Kenny Jean Foster, get out here. Now, you know, when your mom calls all three of your names, it's not good. Something, I, I don't remember what I did. I don't know that I did anything, but I knew I was in trouble. And so I go running down the hall and I got to the kitchen door and the most marvelous sight laid before my eyes. The entire kitchen floor was moving up and down in unison. Everywhere was covered with baby hoppers. They were under the table. They were under the hot water heater, the stove. Well, our kitchen sink just had a curtain in front of it. I don't know if you remember how old kitchens were. And you could see the frogs under the curtain. I just stood there. Wow, this is beautiful. And mom was screaming and stomping her foot. I don't even remember what she was saying. I just look at all of these. This is pretty soon. Mom just yelled my name, Kenny Jane, get these out of my kitchen. Well, do you ever try to catch baby frogs? I, I didn't know. I I scoop them up. I what do I do? I try putting them in my shirt pocket. That didn't work. And it, you couldn't hold them. They were just jumping all over the place. But I figured out that if I pulled my shirt out and put made sort of a basket, I could put the baby frogs in my shirt, hose it to my chest. And then I went to the back door and opened the screen door. There were even more frogs out on the porch. They were 
everywhere. And of course, they were in Blackie's water dish. They were in his food dish. They were all over his blanket. He was barking his head off. And I just stood there laughing. I was like, I can't believe this. Mom took up her position between the kitchen and the living room because mom had just got new carpet in the living room. You know, that kind with the cut pattern of the flowers and stuff in it. And she stood there with her broom pushing baby frogs off of her carpet. Well, I was to get all the frogs out of the kitchen. And I figured out the best way to scoop them up is with a dustpan. You could scoop it along the floor and then you put the dustpan to your chest and you run outside. Now, where do I put them? Back in the wagon. Well, they didn't stay in the wagon. So I got a board and put it over the top of the wagon, ran in the kitchen, scooped up some frogs, put it in my chest, right? Open, uh, lift the board, put the frogs in. Pretty soon that board's bouncing up and down. I was supposed to take all the frogs back to the creek. Well, I made three trips in that direction. We didn't get there ever. <laughs> and we did the best we can, could to get the frogs out of the kitchen and off the porch. And as time goes on, there were frogs everywhere. And these baby frogs became bigger frogs and bigger frogs. There were frogs everywhere in the yard. Dad could not mow the yard. They were in mom's flower garden. They were in dad's vegetable garden. There were frogs everywhere. But as the days got longer and the summer was there, every night we were serenaded with the song of the frogs. Ribbit, ribbit, ribbit. It was a wonderful summer. I love that. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> wonderful. Thank you, Kenneth. Oh my gosh. That's such a fun story. Well, I think we've come to the end of our evening. It's just been full of just beautiful stories. Thank you so much. I'm gonna put it actually onto gallery, I think. How can I do that? Remove spot, sorry. There we go, here we are. Thank you all. Thank you certainly to Sharon who each month takes notes so we can all remember the stories. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for Meg, all you do for the story swap. Thank you very much, Vicky, who has been my right-hand person here and helping me along. Thank you so much. It was the Vicky and Katie team. We talked ourselves into doing this. And I think- That's, be that's because you're both in lavender rooms. <laughs> that's right. You have to paint your room lavender. But, well, Laura's getting quite close to it, maybe. <laughs> anyway, it's just been wonderful. Thank you so much. Maybe we could stop the recording and then if we wanted to chat, we could. Does that sound good? Goodbye, everybody on the recording. Okay. Goodbye. Thank yes. you. <laughs> I'm not leaving. I'm just saying goodbye to the people who are listening to the recording. <laughs>